introduce tonight's speaker, Philomene Wales. Philomene worked as an architect for 40 years before studying printmaking at Morley College. Um, and since then, she's become a member of Printmakers Council and East London Printmakers. Her work is deeply rooted in landscape and a sense of place. And she'll be talking to us this evening about her printmaking practice and her inspirations and how she's worked during lockdown. Um, there'll be an opportunity for you to ask questions at the end of the talk. And you can either ask direct questions or type them into the chat and we'll ask them on your behalf. So now I'll hand you over to Philomene. Thank you, Philomene. Hello, and many thanks to Kate and Teresa for arranging these talks. I know it's a lot of work for them. As Kate said, um, I've, well, I've been asked to talk about my prints that I've been making over the past year, and the ideas and inspiration behind the work, and something about my working methods. I've now been printing for about seven years, studying at Morley College, and also the past couple of years I've been working in a studio at Hackney which I share with another printmaker. I'm based in London, but in normal times, also spend quite a bit of time both in and around Edinburgh and in mid Wales. My work is very much based around the landscape of these areas and the colors, textures and structures observed on urban and rural, rural walks. East Coast Seawolves is a series of monoprints that I was working on early last year prior to the first lockdown. The images are based on memories of the stretch of coastline along the fourth, south of Edinburgh. They do not reference a specific location, but rather are about the essence of a place experienced at different times. They focus on the horizon, although not the point where the land or sea meets the sky, but on that strong horizontal line of light where the water meets the land on the distant shore. This became the defining point and focus for the composition. These are two more prints from this series. Using a similar format for each image, I was exploring the, the changing nature of the light, of the weather and of the time of day, using color and the layering of transpa transparency and of opacity to change the mood. Each print is built up from a number of different plates and surfaces. These include ply sheets with varying degrees of wood grain, found timber surfaces, some etched lino and some cut surface choleograph pieces. I'm very, use, very privileged to have the use of a rather fabulous press, which allows very simple adjustment of the roller height to cope with the variety of materials that I've been using to print from and build up each composition by adding blocks of color more as one might compose a collage or a painting. As we emerged from the first lockdown and I was able to access my studio again, I returned to work on some etchings of Welsh landscape that I had been made, that I had made a couple of years previously. Initially, this was very much about getting back into the rhythm of making work and just enjoying the play between color and surface. I started by expanding the image beyond the view of the original etching and then adding a series of screens that partially obscured that view. My aim was to try and to recreate the experience of visually exploring landscape, focusing on the different elements as the eye travels across it. I, I realized that as I was making them, that these image ex images expressed a longing for places that were not accessible but also held the promise of returning. The screens hid, but also formed a portal to moving forward. Glimpsed is developed from another etching made about, around about the same time as the previous two prints. This again plays with the use of screens as barn doors and the introduction of color to add light and shadow and to increase the feeling of depth to reveal the more distant view. I've always been drawn to the imagery generated by dilapidated rural buildings. These provide a rich source for geometric compositions and of weathered and tactile surfaces. This shows a selection of materials that I've been using to print from. They might be things, anything that catches my eye as having an interesting shape or texture. 
Some become more formal plates, like the bottle wrap, which has become the collagraph plates, the very thick corrugated card that I used to etch lino, or the beach plastic that I've used previously to make soft ground etching plates. Others, such as degraded cans followed, found on the beach or pre-squashed on the road, and old plywood sheets that have completely delaminated over time provide surfaces that I use to print from directly. The box in the middle contains a selection of tried and tested pieces of cut choreograph card and various ply pieces that together form a really useful basic library or kit of parts. Behind the Sun is the first of a series of monoprints that are less about place and more about creating a mood or atmosphere while still playing with the layering of colour and texture. Again, it uses an etching as a starting point, but almost obliterates the original image as a number of textures overlay and morph into each other, moving between areas of light and shadow. Beyond the Horizon has the same etching as its starting point. This is a photo etching I've been working on last February, using the two test plates to overprint and add different tones and tints to the main image. I then added the coloured areas to expand into the area beyond the original etching. Again, these used a range of surfaces, including etched lino, choreograph, as well as just simple corrugated paper and flat colour, and in particular masking parts of the image to create the overlaid colour fields. Across the Divide is another in these series. They all explore movement across the page, mirroring the feeling of walking through woodland or through shadows and into dappled sun. The mid -Wel Welsh landscape regularly throws up long views where the sun penetrates the cloud, casting shafts of light amongst otherwise deep shadow and throwing patches of the countryside into sharp relief. The colours evolve as I develop the print. I don't work on a preconceived colour palette, although I have a specific mood in mind, which informs the way it goes. Colour palettes, tests and sketches. I use very little ink straight from the tube, mixing each colour as the work progresses. This involves much testing, some note taking and a lot of comparing with previous mixes. The image in the middle shows paper scraps left over from basking areas of the prints. These are hugely useful in both creating a, a particular colour, but also for testing new adjacencies and may at some point become collages in their own right. I've always kept sketchbooks, probably a legacy of my architectural training. Like many, I find that drawing is a process of making one look more closely and at details one might otherwise miss. They are full of random thoughts, notes, collage material and minimal line drawings that might be the starting point or a memory prompt. I often leaf through old ones as they can also inform the direction of current work, prompting new thoughts. This and the next slide refer to rural barn Im imagery as the starting point. Soft light of morning positions a shed within a space of shafts of light and shade, imagining the experience of coming upon a derelict building on a woodland walk. The barn motifs re repeat in the applied textures, blurring the sharpness of the shed's form. I was aiming for a softer, more nostalgic feel in long hours of twilight but with the same feeling of a place somewhere between the shadows and sunlight. Looking back over this series of prints, I realise they all have an ambivalent, very much reflecting the mood of emerging from the first lockdown. Pleased it was over, but somewhat apprehensive about what might be coming next. I had absolutely no intention of making anything specifically around the virus, but came to the realization that they are very much visual metaphors for those feelings.
I've included this to show some of the ideas and preoccupations behind the development of these images and my printmaking. I've already mentioned my interest in the geometries set up by rural barns, which provide strong compositional inspiration, as do the textures of patch corrugated sheeting, weathered surfaces of timber, peel peeling painting on hoardings. These are also a rich source for exploring color. Dappled sunlight in woodlands and movement through nature are a more sensory influence. I've always enjoyed rich color and texture and texture in woven fabric and the interplay of warp and weft. In particular, I've taken inspiration from Annie Alba's woven pieces and G's Ben's quilts, both of which have a strong collage and ge geometric feel to them. This series of monoprints uses the etching plates I've been using previously, but together with a much stronger reference to the barn geometries to explore visual contrasts and moods around a very simple framework. The etched image created a very strong portal, whether it's inside looking out or outside looking in and gives a strong sense of distant space. Each print set out with the very deliberate aim to contrast the key colors of the etching with the surrounding color field and using the strong imagery of weatherboard cladding to frame the view. The title of the series references the possibilities of alternative or parallel realities and also how we interpret what these might be. There is always a bit of one in the other and this series considers some of those contrasting realities while also returning to the themes of place, seasons, time of day, weather, and as well as differing moods and emotions and our responses to them. This series was made last autumn before the most recent lockdown, which then called a, a, a halt to making further work for a while. So now I'm back in the studio, really happy to access the press again and have been continuing to explore contrasting textures using a, a more pared back minimalist composition. These are again, three separate prints, all contrasting a formal linear texture with a free form grid with a broken vertical line snaking through its center. I've found this has been interpreted in different ways as a scar or schism or a root or track and really like how it creates this reaction to look more closely. Preparing this talk has been really helpful for me looking back over the recurring themes that have developed almost intuitively and the narrative it has created over the past year. I'm really looking forward to exploring them further for PMC's The Natural World exhibition and Ecologies of Change. Thank you very much, Philomene. That was fantastic. Uh, brilliant. Can you unmute everybody now, Teresa? That was a lovely, that was a fantastic talk. Thank you very much. I see we've already got some questions lined up. Teresa is just going to unmute you so that uh, people who want to ask questions can. That's it, yeah, lovely. Everybody has to unmute themselves, I'm afraid. <laughs> oh, do they? I think everyone's got to unmute themselves. So if you go to the bottom left of your screen at the bottom, you should have a mute button that you can click on mm -hmm. if you want to unmute yourself. Obviously don't do that if you don't want to be recorded. Um, well, while everyone's unmuting themselves, thank you so much for that talk. It was really, really lovely, uh, the way you put that together. Thank you. <laughs> Your work is, is really lovely. Mm -hmm. So I think um, I've got a couple of questions in the chat. Shall I start with those? And then um, if people want to ask direct questions as well. Um, Christina France Cruz asks, do you always work in monoprint or do you sometimes do small editions of your work? Um, I've mostly been, well, I've all entirely been working monoprint this year because um, I haven't had any access to acid. Um, but uh, which I kind of look forward to, but I'm quite keen, even when I do 
um, make etchings to do a variable edition rather than a, a small edition. I have done small editions in the past, but um, I find it more interesting to, to see what else you can do with a plate. Um, but do you often use, uh, say you've got one of your photo etchings, as you showed us in the work, you might use the, the basis of the photo etching and then go on to do quite a lot of variation on that in, in different monoprints. Is that how Absolutely. you Absolutely. Yes. So that some, quite a few of those, I think, would be considered a variable edition, yes. although they, they are very different yeah. um, the way they end up. Um, another question from Sinclair asks, does your choice of paper dramatically affect the colours and tones, particularly the overlapping areas? Um, yes, it does. Um, and it's something in a way that it, I just experiment with. I mean, some of the first, the first time when I was um, doing it with the, the very landscape based, they were um, prints that I already had. Um, I'm now looking at um, using some much thinner Japanese paper that I have, and that's creating a very different feel to it. I'm also looking at how they sit within a larger sheet. Um, well, that, I've shown them as cropped images. It's because they, they kind of have ended up a bit variable like that, but um, I think they do look better when they've got a bit more space around them. So, you know, I could maybe mount some of the smaller ones on a, in a larger way. Yeah. Does anyone have a, yes, Tessa has a question there, I think. Hi, Philomena, thank you very much. That was fantastic. Loved some of those images you were showing. You, you can clearly see your, geo, uh, your architectural uh, influence in a lot of the work. Um, I was just wondering, do you make larger prints or are they, because they were all roughly 30, 25, 30 by 30, do you do them bigger? Do you do them on a bigger scale? I think I'm aiming to work bigger. <laughs> that might be the next challenge. I mean, it, another challenge. It's very different. I'm trying to work on a bigger scale and it's, mm -hmm. it's a bit of a mind bender thing. Mm -hmm. So it'd be interesting to see them large, I think. Mm -hmm. And I quite like the degree of detail that you can get within that sort of 30 by 30 format. Um, seems, you know, it seems to be able to contain quite a lot within that. Um, yeah, I think Stan had a question, then possibly Sinclair, I'm not sure. Yeah, Stan next then. Um, thank you very much, Philomena. That is, uh, really love your work, particularly the, the Hidden Door series. I think they're superb. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, one question, do, do you use um, oil paints in your application or is it always printing ink? It's all printing ink. Printing um, ink. I've got um, some very old Lawrence inks, which oil based, which, um, but even those I don't use straight out of the tube. Mm -hmm. And I've been a bit kind of free and easy with moving, mixing them with the um, Caligo water based ones they seem to work quite well together yeah, yeah. um that's quite interesting because uh, a, a lot of the times if i'm doing anything I'll, I'll use oil paint to put a little bit more plate oil with it to make it a bit more um mm -hmm. and that that's it that seems to work seems to yeah work. I, I i was considering trying that because i have got some oil paints that you know add to a, a different range of colors yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, I, I love I love your work it's superb thank you uh, Philippa Champagne. Hi, thank you. That was really interesting. I I was really particularly interested in how you sometimes start with a mood, and I just wondered if you could say a bit more about that. Um, it's quite hard. It's it in some ways it develops as I develop the print. Um, mm. I don't think it's a mood that I've I'm particularly feeling myself. It's not about sort of feeling happy or depressed. It's more mm. about thinking about, um, it's like having memories of landscape. It's about thinking what it was like being in a place. Yeah. Um, and trying to capture that, the sort of quality of the space or of the place. Yes, I really liked the prints where you did two different times of day. Mm -hmm the morning, early morning and the twilight and the, the contrast. I thought that was 
Mm. Fascinating. Yeah. What I was interested in, um, Philomene, was uh, whether you, you said you sort of develop as you go along, but do you have any idea when you first start creating your print roughly what you want it to look like, or is it a very organic process with you? Mm -hmm. I think it, I, I mean, I usually start off with putting down um, a 30 by 30 piece of colour and that I place pretty carefully on the sheet of paper using a registration board. And I then work, um, so I, I have an idea when, if it's going to be more of a sort of landscape feel to it. Um, so I might layer some horizontal lines within it. Um, some of the, the early ones um, started using a, um, an, a couple of pieces of wood which have very kind of sea-based look feel to them um, or watery um, effects and they, they would really that so the texture also dictates um, the way it goes yeah, and what I find quite very interesting about your work is having trained as an architect, mm -hmm. you seem to be very interested in the complete opposite, if you like, in the dilapidated buildings and the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the weathered process and all, all of that. Do you think that's a reaction to having been so involved um, with construction of buildings, perhaps? I'm, I think I like the way that they might age as yeah. well. Um, I did work some of the time on on um, renovation work and sort of appreciating the the sort of patina that time gives older buildings yeah although I, i'm also very fond of you know very sharp minimalist modern buildings as well yeah. and I, I worked for a, a bit quite a bit on um, w um the company i work with um did a lot of 20th century concrete restoration of the sort of 1920s and that semi-minimalist but really um, carefully structured um, buildings it was yeah. a great feeling for as well. Yeah. I don't know how that relates to my work exactly. But... No, I'm sure it all feeds in doesn't it and the other mm. sort of issue related to that was do you ever do any prints based on an urban setting or is it always a rural setting that uh, um, inspires you? I've mostly, um, it's mostly rural, but again, sort of, you know, actually just walking around Hackney and looking at boarded up shops or yes. um, hoardings. Um, I think one of the, um, the sort of inspirational um, pictures was of a paint hoarding. Um, and I kind of, and I sort of walk along the street looking at things like that quite yeah. often. Yeah. So it's, it's sort of goes in somewhere, I think. Yeah, I love the composite image towards the end of your talk with all the, the facades of all the old mm. wooden buildings and, mm. and the tapestries as well, the textiles. Mm. I think that, that was really great. Mm. Um, so do we have more questions from our, oh, Trita has a question, there we are. <laughs> Silly questions, really, I suppose. Um, so, um, what? Okay, what? You must have been drawing a lot in order to be wanting to become an architect. So, do mm. you know what it was that made you want to be an architect rather than an artist first? Um, I think I was discouraged from being an artist by my parents, oh. who both were. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> Um, I kind of latched on the thought that architecture might be a good um, thing to investigate, certainly. Mm. And it's, it certainly is a great training that gives you a, a very wide range of um, things to look at and ways of thinking. Um, it's a very broad education, um, even if you don't end up, I mean, I used it, but, you know, even if you don't use it, I, I think it's, a, a really great um, thing to have done. Um, and but and so as an architect, I've always drawn and I was I always have drawn as you know when I've been on holiday as well. and that's mostly been landscape, sometimes buildings. But I think I prefer drawing natural objects to buildings. 
on the whole. And the colours that you choose, you say, mm. I mean, I could see all the swatches mm. of colours and they were very, they related totally to each other and they were very mm. subtle. And mm. uh, so how, how do you choose your colours? What emotions do you look for? It's somehow it just, sort of, it's what feels right. And you put something down and then you, you think what you would, is going to react to it, whether you want something that's um, a really, a, you know, quite complementary to it or something that might just modify it very slightly if you're overlaying it. So it gives a, a subtler colour. And I tend to use quite similar bases for each colour mix so that even if I'm doing two contrasting colours, one will have a bit of the other in it. Yeah. Um, so that they have a they kind of go together in a, a more um, coherent manner. Yeah. I mean, even, uh, you know, as something like a, a, a kind of indigo blue and a, a, a ochre might have a little bit of one or the other in it, and it just brings the two together. Brilliant. And it's a very small amount that you need, but it's it just um, seems to help. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we have some we have a, a variety of questions now in the comment in the chat section so Beverly Stewart asks do you use layers of separate pieces of paper I think do you use layers of separate pieces of paper on your initial print not at all no um, I start off as I said um, maybe usually well starting off with a, um, a basic um, format for the print I then effectively work upside down and I put the, the, print, the, the print on the bed of the press and I look at how I'm going to arrange the other pieces that I'm printing on, on top of it. Um, and it's, um, or I look at what I'm going to mask out. So when I've been working with um, etchings, as a base, for example, I might cut a, a piece of paper that masks part of the etching and part of the background so that it, I can then put a, a solid colour down over the rest of the sheet. So are there many stages to each monoprint? You might have... Absolutely. It's, yeah. um, and I, I quite often just need to leave them for, you know, a day to um, so I can work over the top. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, so I, I might work on it's it's one of the reasons I think that it's some of the have come out as series that I've worked on two or three at the same time, and I and I can pin them up on the wall and kind of look at them at, from a long view and see what they need um, and what the next step might be. And I guess working like that, one thing might influence the other, and so it's mm. yeah, absolutely. And sometimes. You realise you've made a, a sort of mistake. What might be a mistake might, might be a happy accident, and you've added something that you didn't quite mean to, but it's worked, or you have to correct it in yeah. another way. Oh, brilliant! Can um, I just ask? Oh, sorry. Hmm? Sorry, who's yes? Just buttering, Christina. I was just butting hmm. into um, ask Philomene about something that just caught my attention. There, uh, Philomene, you said you uh, you go back. So do you put the dry print back on the press and work over or do you re-soak or maybe you don't? I, I, I haven't been soaking the paper for these prints. Ah, oh, right. So I've, I've been, yeah, okay. For printing dry. I mean, obviously the etchings were done on yeah. damp paper, but so then they've been dried and then, and then it's stay, stuck with a, a, a dry paper print. Interesting, okay, yeah. <laughs> I don't think you could do it the other way around quite because you'd um, so I don't think you could start with the relief and then add the etching in that way and it no. would be harder to sort out the registration as well yeah 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 because it can be a nightmare if you want to work on something afterwards and then you have to go back and... anyway very very interesting thanks I'll mute because I have got my dog <laughs> <laughs> Join in. One, another question from the chat. Uh, well, it's kind of there's several questions actually asking about 
artists and printmakers who have inspired you? And you've always already mentioned Annie Elbers. Um, and someone has also asked whether you've taken your work into textiles at any point. So I guess the question is, have you taken your work into textiles and other artists and printmakers who may have influenced you? Um, gosh, artists that have inspired so many. You <laughs> mentioned Agnes Martin and whether, oh. whether Tessa's asking whether Agnes Martin is... Oh, a great player. hero, yeah. yes. Yeah. yeah. That very stripped back, um, minimalist approach that... Yeah. Still speaks at complete volumes. Yes, that would be an something to aspire to, really. <laughs> yeah. And have you also sort of looked at colour theory as well in relation oh, to? Yeah, very much. I mean, the um, written book of colour theory is is really interesting. Um, you know, and th that whole the whole theory of um, putting colours together. Yeah. Um, and so have you used textiles in your work or created textiles or? Um, not really at all, no. no. Um, Could be the next I mean, actually something in the, on the textile, I have, I have always been intrigued with um, Japanese borrow um, textiles, which is the kind of indigo um, patchwork that's um, piecing, you know, pieces together on a quite random mending basis. Yeah. And uh, it, that might come back to the, the weathered surface thing that I like the idea of um, patching and mending. Yeah. And you see that on um, urban build, uh, on sorry, on rural buildings as well, the barns always, you know, have bits patched in. They don't sort of take it off and start again. You're right, they just fill the hole in or whatever it is. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. with whatever they happen to have. Um, so, you know, it might <clears> be <throat> what was there originally. Um, and I just love that, so the way that you get um, something that's far more interesting somehow than something, you know, the sort of the clean lines. <laughs> yes, and it tells you about the people that have been inhabiting it, the space. Absolutely. Well. I think that going back to your question about architecture was it's some buildings I've been in, you can feel the people who have lived there previously and that kind of sense of occupation is very interesting and that might be something that you one picks up um, yeah. sort of very intuitively really. Oh Teresa has a question. I've got another one. If you <laughs> and Philip yeah. <laughs> oh it's just a quick one. So um, just about the, because you've got incorporated both, uh, I assume it's photo etching in, in with it or soft ground etching possibly in with your uh, mono printing or mono typing. Mm -hmm. um, do you, is that how you started when you went to printmaking? Did you start with photo etching or? I, I, I started at Morley um, while I was still working as an architect. Um, they were running a, a really excellent six week introduction to printmaking um, on a Friday and I was able to get a four day week and do it. And that covered everything, well, not everything, but it covered etching and relief and choreograph. And it was a very much a kind of whip through. Um, and subsequently I've, I've I really enjoy everything. I just went, the day I went into that studio and I smelt the ink, I thought, this is great. This is what I'm <laughs> doing. Um, and yeah, and I've, I, yeah, I love, I really like trying different techniques, really. I um, think, which is why I've, I enjoy doing, you know, seeing what I can get out of a bit of, you know, material that I find on the beach or something like that. Um, I think. Philippa had a question too. Yeah, so I was just interested in, there seemed to be quite a light and dark theme and kind of seeing through and seeing into the distance. And I wondered how you achieved that, if you sort of did ghost prints for some of them or if you um, used extender to make the, the ink more transparent mm. or what kind of techniques you use? Because I thought that was very effective, that sense of looking into the distance. Mm. You, you don't really get a uh, ghost print as such from what I'm doing, unless I just kind of put another sheet of paper over it yeah. and, and lost it. 
but yeah, I use tubes of extender. Right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, I just keep, you know, adding it or, you know, adding small amounts um, to extender to test how transparent something is mm. going to come out. And then you kind of end up, it can be get very sticky, but um, you just have to <laughs> <laughs> go with it. <laughs> We've got lots of lots of compliments on your talk, Philomene. Thank you Thank for sharing your practices, Victoria Johns. Uh, particularly enjoyed the series where I didn't know if I was viewing from the inside or outside of the building. I think it was the sliding doors series. Thank you. Um, lots of comments on your thought-provoking and interesting work. Sinclair, it's, yeah. Can I just ask a quick question, please? Yes, of course. Yeah, it's just, uh, Philomene, uh, about your materials. I saw uh, at one point in your talk, uh, um, sort of bags of materials, which reminded me of my garage and, and the sort of things I put together in terms of bits of material and bits of uh, uh, all, all kinds of different textures. Do you collect lots of those? Do you have a, a sort of store of them that you draw on for different projects that you work on? Yeah, I have a, I, I pick things up randomly yes. um, I think my family think I'm slightly bonkers like that um, <laughs> but yes yeah, so I I don't necessarily have something in mind when I keep something but um, it might be you know I might have it in a box for a couple of years yes even <laughs> I'm sure you realize that syndrome yes and um, we had some in fact we had some work builders work going on during the first lockdown and they had some rather good textures bits of material that um, I had to snip off bits to um, <laughs> use um, some rather good gridded plastic that you can use under plaster um, all sorts of things like that and um, doing rubbings of floor the floor where they'd sort of taken bits up before they um they had were finished so i quite yeah i quite like this the textures um, that are hidden behind um surfaces as well yeah fantastic thank you can i have one last question please yes cool right philomene so we get it all get it right um i wrote down loads of things but one of the things i wrote down was how many times will you run an image through the press in order to complete the work and do you know when it's complete or do you keep you know do you how do you stop and how many times do you run it through i think there is a limit to the number of layers of ink you can add um even sort of quite transparent ones um on top of each other maybe 10 maybe a dozen um and it's kind of when it feels right. It might be the same that painters say it. You know when it's done. It's not really starting off with, say, this is what I'm going to produce. It's more feeling, uh, right, that seems to have achieved what I was hoping to achieve, or yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have to stop here because it's not. <laughs> I liked all the little extra pieces you had. You had a whole collage of little bits that you, I think you must have used them for testing out and um, blocking off. I love all those kind of random pieces that appear. I think they're fantastic. Yeah, no, I found them really interesting as well. And, you know, good starting points to do something else. And um, both the colours and also creating a, a you know very simple compositions that um, you think oh well that could be something else maybe mm, was a bit. Mm. So, and then I think Victoria has questions yes sorry sorry mm -hmm. um, you were talking about possibly in future trying out some Japanese paper I'm just wondering what roughly what white paper you currently use is it a lighter stock because you don't dampen it or it's lighted. I mean, I find it. It's very. There's about two hundred and something. I think um, some are set. A lot of the. It's a balance between what you can print an etching on, and the those ones are, are certainly on Somerset. Where I'm stuck. 
the most recent ones that I'm working on at the moment, which are, are purely um, relief, um, seem to be working very nicely on really, really quite thin Japanese paper. And um, I don't know what weight it is, uh, but it's got, it's definitely got a, a rough and a smooth side and the smooth side seems to take in really beautifully. I think we've probably come to the end of all questions now. So thank you so much for the meeting. That's a fantastic talk. Really thank interesting. You. Very inspiring. If you can unmute in the round yeah. of applause. <laughs> thank you very much. I think you you've given us all a lot of food for thought going forward mm -hmm. about how we carry out our own work and perhaps where we get our inspiration from and all those things. So uh, it's been fantastic. And thank you for everybody for joining us this evening. That's been great. Thank you.